All right. So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Beatrice Erkers. At Foresight Institute, Beatrice, as COO and Director of Existential Hope, focuses on nurturing a scientific community dedicated to future-oriented technologies. She manages the Existential Hope Group, encouraging thoughtful discussions on technology's role in society. Beatrice also co-hosts the Existential Hope podcast and oversees its platform, fostering a space for collaborative exploration and ideas. Her work is centered around connecting people and ideas to shape a positive technological future. Beatrice, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me. This is my first transmission. Um, and I'm quite new to the transhumanist community, but I'm, you know, I hope this topic will resonate well with the sort of transhumanist ethos. Um, so I'm here today to talk about existential hope, which I, um, I'm going to dive a bit deeper into what I actually mean when I say that later. But for now, I'll just say that, yeah, I'm the CEO at Foresight Institute and um, the director of the existential hope program. Um, and so existential hope is, uh, is a project that we do at the Foresight Institute. Um, maybe a few of you are familiar with Foresight Institute because it's been around for a really long time, since 1986, actually. Um, it was co-founded by Christine Peterson and Eric Drexler, and we focus very much on like advancing technology for the long-term benefit of life. This is our, our mission statement. Um, and so normally that means we focus a lot on like these specific technologies, technolo technologies that we think are promising, basically. So that could be, you know, originally it was very much focused on molecular nanotechnology because of Eric Drexler and his vision. Um, now we also focus a lot on longevity and biotechnology. We focus on uh, computation and AI, space, and also neurotech since like two years back. Um, and so existential hope is obviously a bit different from, from all of those. It's, um, it's like our philosophical program, one could say, um, where we sort of ask the question of where are we advancing all of this technology towards? Like what's the goal of all of this? Um, this, this work that we're doing. Um, we call it the, the contextualizer of all our other groups. Um, and as you can probably tell by the mission that we have here, we're quite excited by the opportunities and possibilities of technology at Foresight. Um, but one thing that we've also been thinking a lot about is that um, we think it's important to sort of consider the path to technological progress, like how do we get as much upside and as little downside as possible. Um, so we see sort of two main narratives being told right now, uh, if you want to simplify um, in terms of uh, technological progress. So one is this like more existentially pessimistic vision for humanity. Um, and I'm going to illustrate it with this Nietzsche quote today. Um, in some remote corner of the universe, poured out and glittering in innumerable solar system there once was a star on which clever animals invented knowledge. That was the highest and most mendacious minute of world history, yet only a minute. After nature had drawn a few breaths, the star grew cold, and the clever animals had to die. There have been eternities when it did not exist, and when it is done for again, nothing will have happened. So that is quite, quite gloomy, obviously. It's like this. Um, idea of existential risk that I'm sure you know uh, all of you are, are familiar with of like we we may end up killing ourselves with technology um, it's it's quite doom and gloomy uh, and we don't want that to happen but then the sort of second um, narrative that we see today like growing is the uh, the one of accelerationism um, that suggests that you know the best way to to make things change is just like sort of untethered um, accelerationism, um, you know, sort of viewing economic growth and technological progress as almost the sole goals it's in themselves. Uh, and it can often like embrace quite radical change quite abruptly. Um, and I'll illustrate that with a quote from Mark Andreessen's Technoptimist Manifesto. Um, we believe in accelerationism, the conscious and deliberate propulsion of technological development to ensure the fulfillment of the law of accelerating returns, 
to ensure the techno capital upward spiral continues forever. Um, and so, as we saw, I think, from uh, Anders' slides before, actually, there's like quite a few different movements now, and we're trying to like tread the needle of how do we make, not necessarily make all of them happy, but at least try to get everyone to like cooperate and, and have like uh, positive sum games come from this. Um, so we think that there's a need for like a, a sort of third way and a third approach, and that's this, um, that's, the, yeah, the existential hope angle that we're trying to get to. Um, so that's, that's one where we like, we're trying to get people excited about a highly technological future, while also still, you know, considering the path to get there. Like, how can we get there in a, a smart way? Um, and the way that we, we think uh, at Foresight, since we work with these, like developing these technologies, we're very excited about, for example, differential technology development, um, passwords, like any strategy that, you know, you aim to accelerate development that aims um, of, of like beneficial technologies and slowing down anything that we think could be potentially harmful near term. Um, so sort of seeking to to maximize positive impact and minimize risk. Um, and this this is just uh, to illustrate where we actually like stole the term from uh, of existential hope. Um, it's from a paper by Oxford philosophers Toby Ord and Onkan Barrett. Um, they wrote a paper called Existential Risk and Existential Hope, um, where they sort of try to define the concept of uh, existential risk, and also then um, come up with this concept of existential hope. Uh, and they suggest that uh, maybe we shouldn't just focus on decreasing existential risk, maybe we should also work on increasing existential hope. Um, and yeah, these are just two quotes from the paper that I think um, illustrate it well. Armed with this concept, we can draw a new lesson. Just as we should strive to avoid existential catastrophes, catastrophes, sorry, uh, we should also seek existential EU catastrophes. So a EU catastrophe is like the opposite of a catastrophe. It's an event where once it has happened, the value of the world is much higher off. Um, and we think that this captures a natural class of events and what may be an important one. We hope that having a label for the concept may help others to make better judgments about what courses to pursue. So that's also what we um, hope to do with like the existential hope project to to have a label to sort of um, help people get excited by the future under um, and a few uh, things that we have considered in doing this work is like well what are the pros and cons of this um, of like trying to work to increase existential hope whatever whatever that means um, I'll start with the cons because it's more fun to end on the pros, I think. So uh, <laughs> one thing is just that um, it, it's kind of difficult to argue uh, against <laughs> working on existential risk, and I'm, I would never argue against working on existential risk. Um, but it's it's you know it's always like one could always say that. Um, it's always more f important to focus on existential risk because like if we go extinct there is no future you know there is no no opportunity at all there's no value uh, also like existential risk is it's just more concrete um, more like straightforward to communicate it around um, and you know that makes it kind of like a compelling and uniting focus for for collective action I think um, as compared to like fussy positive visions of the future um, I also think, think that resonates a bit with with what Anders was finishing on. Like, um, we need like these collective visions that people can actually uh, get excited about. Um, and existential risk is something that I think almost all can can agree on. Whereas, you know, uh, visions of the future we don't tend to agree on so much in terms of what we think um, what we think would be nice. Um, and then there's also the the point that. Uh, work on existential hope could could lead to other like more existential risks basically because if we just like accelerate technology development and um, and speed things up um, that could lead to to just increased risks um, and then um, it's also a case we made that maybe maybe it won't 
maybe it won't work, maybe it won't like, you know, the sort of uh, utopian thinking um, has historically led to a few negative outcomes as well, uh, I think it's fair to say. Um, and um, it can be seen as like a bit detached, detached from, from you know, present day concerns and, you know, have this type of backlash that I know that uh, you were talking about transhumanism also having had. Um, and so I think all in all, it's like uh, quite straightforward to say that, you know, it's, it's really challenging to craft an appealing vision of the future. Um, and it's just really easy to come off as like Pollyannish or naive uh, when, when trying to sort of argue that case. Um, but then we have the pros uh, and like why we think that actually this is worth for us to do at Forsyth Institute. Um, and I think the, the first one is just like trying to counter that negative future bias that we have. Um, cur currently, you know, there's like very definitely a perceived dominance of uh, dystopian narratives um, over like any <laughs> optimistic vision of the future. Um, but hopefully by like focusing on, on more like very positive futures, uh, we could try to balance that out and stimulate a more positive outlook, uh, which I think is needed for like actually making uh, action happen. Um, then there's also uh, the point that, well, it can actually help us generate ideas for new causes and inventions, interventions. So um, even if it's just, um, you know, it, it really recognizes that the future could be very, very vast, I think, um, and that the, the difference in outcomes of different, uh, different type of futures, I think, could be really big. So. Um, like a default future may be very valuable, but if we actually manage to uh, create, um, you know, a few, make a few tweaks that can make it maybe, maybe way more uh, valuable, you know, it's sort of the astronomical uh, case by that Bostrom makes as well. Um, then, yeah, there's the case that future, this, the future seems to be coming <laughs> fast at us right now, I think. Um, I think especially with the AI development, Recently, that's something that I think uh, even even people outside of like the the futurist uh, bubble has recognized. Uh, I think there's a lot of information value in just exploring that. Uh, that you know, um, well, it, there hasn't really been that much um, effort into um, sort of examining uh, what can we do to increase existential hope. What what futures uh, do people really want? Um, and then for us at Forsyth, I think uh, especially like attracting more people to work on shaping the long-term future is really important. Uh, and I wrote like transhumanist there because I do think that it's really interesting um, that when you look at who, like the people that started thinking about existential risk, it's like um, a lot of them are or were transhumanists maybe before they started thinking about that, like Nick Bostrom or uh, Eliezer, I think, um, Andesh as well. Um, yeah, like because they actually really recognize the value, the potential value of the future, and um, are just really, really uh, excited about it, and then, you know, don't want to miss out on it, and therefore want to, like, make sure that it happens um, by decreasing existential risk. Um, so sort of just increasing that emotional connection to the future to get mo people motivated to actually work, uh, work on improving it. And then I think for us at Foresight, there's also like this point that I was trying to make of bridging the gap between different communities because we have a very diverse, like we've, we're really proud at Foresight to have like very diverse opinions. Uh, we've been around since the 80s and we have just, um, I don't think anyone agrees about anything at our conferences almost, but it's, it's really nice because everyone is excited uh, and nice to each other, but it's, it's totally okay to disagree. Um, and, and this sort of umbrella of existential hope can help us like talk about the future in a way that hopefully gets people excited about it, but also, like I said, you know, uh, sort of allows the effect of altruists in also to think about the existential risks and all of these things. Um, and so I actually um, chose the option free quote from you, Andesh, because uh, I was listening to the 80,000 hours podcast recently that you were on, um, and it said, I will um, try to illustrate it. Uh, I think one reason I started on this, meaning writing uh, the book on grand futures, was I realized we need to write about hope. 
A lot of my research is about existential risk and global catastrophes or other dreadful things. Quite often journalists ask me, but how do you sleep at night? And I usually explain, well, quite well, because I'm thinking that I'm doing my part to reduce some of the risk. But the deeper answer is that I'm really optimistic, and you have to be optimistic about the future to want to save it. If the future actually could be very grand, we have a very good reason to save it. And I think that that's like um, a really important point. And um, sort of, I guess what I'm trying to say is like we need more of that transhumanist excitement for the future, um, where we both want to like develop it and change it and make it happen, but we also want to protect it so that we can get to experience it. Um, and so I'll just round off on saying, um, trying to say like, what what is it that we're actually trying to do at Foresight with it? Because it's it's very new to us. Um, we've we've not been doing this group for very long. It's like a few years. Um, and so everything currently, I think, is an experiment. But um, I would love to just tell you a bit about it and see uh, if you'd be interested in engaging with any of it. So first of all, it sort of started with my colleague Allison um, collecting all of these resources on uh, existential hope. Like, um, so now we have a, an entire like digital library um, where we try to curate like a journey where you can start reading about like this existential risk and existential hope, um, and then like go through all the different sort of uh, technologies that we're excited about for the future, and yeah, really trying to like get concrete about um, what possibilities are out there. Um, and then we have uh, this uh, newest experiment that we're doing. Um, it's coming up in a few weeks in the Bay Area. We're doing a hackathon on uh, institution design for transformative AI scenarios. Um, so I think that'll be really interesting. It's also uh, also new, uh, a first for us to do this, but we'll see how it goes. We're gonna try to put out our report after the event also, so hopefully um, if you're not able to go, you can still like um, read up on the results. Um, and this one, uh, I think is really interesting. This is also uh, first year this year that we're trying to do like um, w like a course or a world building challenge. Uh, it's entirely remote, so uh, you can apply to join on the website. Um, where it's basically going to be like eight weeks, where we're going to work um, in groups to build out like advanced worlds. So do doing world building. Um, and like taking it <laughs> seriously um, and uh, yeah like building out different aspects so you have like holistic uh, worlds with like positive visions of the future but also not to detach from where we are right now it needs to also be like um, a world that we can see ourselves getting to uh, in these um, just 20 years now about um, and then the last thing is the hope drop which is a monthly newsletter that we do. Um, that I, uh, yeah, if you're interested in this stuff, I highly rec recommend that you subscribe to it. Um, we try to like collect a bunch of news and resources um, that uh, are happening in the sort of existential hope sphere. Um, and we always drop a podcast episode. These are a few of my favorites. Um, I recommend the one with David Deutsch uh, in particular. Um, yeah, it's. We, we always invite uh, scientists or technologists to talk about like, well, actually, like what are existential hope scenarios or positive visions of the future that you can enable with your work. Um, so yeah, I think this is my, my call to action for you all. It's just like, it would be really interesting to hear your thoughts on all of this. I know as transhumanists, you probably thought a lot about this already. Um, so we have a form on our website where you can just yeah share your thoughts. You can also share your favorite resources if you have anything that you think should be added to our library, for example. Um, would be super curious to hear about that. And then I would also um, ask that you please like sign up to the Hope Drop because then we can actually stay in contact. And that's it. Thank you.